three first names. Uh, I should have been a rock star, like you know David Lee Roth or something. That would have been fantastic. But no, no, I had to go into computer science. Uh, what I was thinking. Um, I am the director of uh, software engineering for IBM. Uh, I've been with IBM for 17 years. It's crazy even to say that sometimes. Um, and I'm also an IBM Distinguished Engineer. There are about 300 of us in the company, which doesn't sound that impressive until you realize there are 483,000 employees in IBM. A uh, couple of interesting things of in what I do. I and my team build software for companies that allow their employees to collaborate and work together better. It's a pretty cool job. We help people actually do their jobs far better than they could do them by themselves. Uh, I've been in this field for a long time. I started off actually coding this weird product called Lotus Notes, somebody might have heard of. Um, and at the time, I worked for this guy named Ray Ozzie that some of you older guys might know who Ray Ozzie is. Um, Ray Ozzie, by the way, uh, Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft or co-founder of Microsoft, once said Ray Ozzie was the best programmer he ever met. And I would agree with him. Ray Ozzie was amazing. So uh, I'm here to talk to you about something I identified literally about eight months ago. And it's that software engineering in general, and more specifically software engineering in building software for companies, for enterprises, is dramatically changing. In fact, it's changing at such a rapid pace that most of the vendors that make this software can't even keep up. So I'd like to start off talking to you about something that maybe is a little bit subtly different um, than you normally hear from some IBM executive. Um, I'm going to start off talking to you about, well, pufferfish. Pufferfish. You know, they're the animal, they get scared, they pull poke this, make themselves look larger. They're also a delicacy in Japan. Now, the bad thing about eating pufferfish is it's poisonous. And about two out of a hundred end up either in the hospital or dead from eating it. So I have a little story for you. Um, it takes me back to sort of my past. Uh, I grew up in the 1980s. Um, and in early 1990, I was a Sega guy. I had a Sega Genesis for those from <coughs> Europe or in Asia, a Sega Mega Drive. And I hated Nintendo with a passion, unbeknownst to man. I couldn't stand them. What's really interesting is Sega, by 1992, had a 50% market share in the North American market against Nintendo from virtually nothing to begin with. Their marketing director was a gentleman named Al Nielsen. And Al was really confused because he had a 50% market share in the United States and Canada and Mexico, but the market share in Japan was 10% against Nintendo. What was happening? So he flew over to Japan to meet with his colleagues and peers in Japanese marketing. And they talked and such, and I'm sure they, you know, they had a wonderful time in the office. But afterwards, they went to get sushi. It's Japan, why not, right? So they sat down at the sushi restaurant, and his Japanese colleagues, Al's Japanese colleagues, started giggling. And they said, we've ordered you something special just for you. And you know what it is, pufferfish. So with ceremony, it came down, plopped in front of him. Soy sauce was prepared, really fresh wasabi, you know, diced up. The real wasabi, not the stuff that we normally eat. Wasabi's not really green, by the way, FYI. Um, and Al thought about it for a moment. OK, two out of 100 seems like reasonable odds. So he takes his chopsticks, comes down, dips it in the soy sauce. He's put a little wasabi in because it's better that way. And He says, it's good. And then he picked up the plate and he offered it to his hosts from Japanese marketing, the ones with the 10% market share. And they refused to eat it. And then he realized why they only had a 10% market share in Japan. They were unwilling to take any risks they were unwilling to try. They were unwilling to fail. And that might have been fine in 1985, seven years before that, when they were doing reasonably well. But it is not fine at that time where you want to win in the marketplace, where you want to move forward in the marketplace. I tell you this story because I had an epiphany 
about building software uh, in August. Um, I actually got the current job I have the 1st of August, so I've had it for almost nine months now. That's frightening. I could have had a child by now. Sometimes it feels like I had a child by now. Um, but uh, I was in San Francisco three weeks ago uh, in front of uh, a couple hundred people, and, and I put this slide up, and you could have heard the gasp in the room. I mean, these are all IBM customers, and they're looking at this line going, you have no interest in building software for us? <laughs> yeah, why are we paying all this support for you? Um, and even worse, you know, uh, the, the product that I build is a $150 million business for IBM, which sounds really impressive when you consider, until you consider that IBM makes $80 billion a year, <laughs> which makes me an apostrophe. However, um, I, I put this up and I said, that, you know, I don't have a great deal of interest in making software for you. I really don't. However, I have a great deal of interest in making software with you. And this fundamentally changes everything that you think about in building software. Now some of you saw the presentation before talking about open source and bringing open source into the enterprise and how that really changes things. I want to go one step further in software engineering. I want to literally in real time build software with my customers and partners. And that's what I've set out to do since August 1st. Something that, by the way, has never been done before that I am aware of in enterprise software development. Certainly never in IBM. I have like 50 lawyers chasing me around every day in IBM to try to stop me. And not very successful so far. Uh, and this leads us to something that uh, is very interesting. So if you, you put your finger in, in front of your eyes, your eyes will turn in opposite directions to try to focus on a particular object. There is an English term for this, virgins. It's not convergence, it's called vergence. And I'm seeing this right now in software. So we, we heard about open source and how open source is really changing the enterprise. Well, what if it's not just open source? What, it's all, what if it's also customers' needs are changing dramatically and at a faster and faster rate that other vendors simply can't keep up with it? What if all of these things are actually coming together just like holding your finger up in front of your face? Well. I believe that's true. I believe we have reached a virgins. Um, but there's some really interesting reasons for that. Uh, and the first one, and frankly my favorite, is how. We do not often talk about the how in software, right? We don't talk about how it was built. We don't talk about the people that built it. Why? If you hire a plumber to come into your house, you're probably going to check out to see what tools he uses and what products he's going to use inside your home lest you wake up in the middle of the night with your toilet flooding your bathroom. Right? The how is actually really, really, really important in software engineering. The people that build software to me are far more important than the code itself. If you look at Andy Hertzfeld and his cast of crazies, less than, by the way, 50 people who built the original Macintosh. And that's hardware and software, by the way. right? If you look at those people, those were the best of the best of the best. They were a community. They cared about each other. They played together. They coded together. They worked all night if they had to. And they slept all day if they needed to. Right? The how is really, really important. And that stretches into things like uh, we were talking about waterfall in the last session. I think waterfall, frankly, is evil and must be destroyed at all costs. I, I would take a bonfire to it. Heck, I'd use one of those um, fire bombs the American military has and drop it on it. Um, it has, frankly, devastated our ability to iterate and go faster in software engineering. So agile is really important, but there's some other things around the how that you should realize. So when I took control of Connections Engineering, which is like 239 engineers, um, so it's a relatively large engineering team scattered in seven different labs all around the world, from Boston, Massachusetts, to Shanghai, to Beijing, to Austin, Texas, to Raleigh, Durham, to Dublin, Ireland, and Haifa in Israel. So you can imagine, I never sleep. Um, but we had a lot of engineers, I like to call I-shaped engineers. They were really, really good at one thing and understood nothing else about the product in which they were effectively engineers for. I do not believe in I-shaped engineers. I'll give you a great example. Um, my first week in this new job, I'm on a build call. First of all, we no longer have build calls. I don't even understand what a build call is. But we had one. 
to be on the phone while the software is building. Like you really need 30 people on the phone listening and watching the software being built. But whatever, you know, I'm sure it was an IBM process for some reason. But we're on the call and I'm sitting there you know, basically zoning out and I have like a sugar-free Red Bull and I'm like, dear God, get me off this phone, right? And all of a sudden, something perks my interest. And they said, well, the build has to stop. I say, what? Why is the build stopping? Well, we need Travis. Now I'm thinking in my mind, the CI tool, we need Travis. Why do we need Travis to do a build? Well, maybe we need Travis. They were talking about a person. This one guy is Travis, right? And literally, he's the only guy who knew that code out of 239 engineers. That's insane. Right? This is why I'm telling you the how is really, really, really important in software development. What you really want in an organization are T-shaped individuals. I'm really good at one thing, but I know everything about my product. I'll give you another antidote so you can kind of understand why I-shaped engineering doesn't scale. Uh, the product that um, I produce is effectively social networking and social communities for businesses. Right? So it has all sorts of features. It's got blogging capabilities and wikis and forums and communities and file storage and profiles and all the kinds of things you can normally think about that a social system would have, right? But I had a blog team when I took my job and a wiki team and a forum team. Now keep in mind, all of these systems share the same database and have the same navigation. So when you looked at the product on August 1st of last year and you went from blogs to wikis, the fonts changed. The thickness of the bars changed. I, and it looked like there was 20 different products in this one product, which is, by the way, not an inexpensive product to buy for a company. Right? Why? They never even looked at the other parts of the product. Oh, no, I'm a blog guy. Blogs looks great. Right? I do not believe, again, in I-shaped engineers. I believe in T-shaped engineers. The other thing um, that's, that's really interesting about the how is being willing to fail. So I've banned a phrase in my engineering organization. Uh, the phrase in English is, I have concerns. The next person in my organization who says, I have concerns, congratulations, you now own the problem. What you need are people who are willing to try things. They see a problem, great. Go and figure out some solutions for it. Don't come to me and expect me to solve your problems. And this gets into my last sort of rant on why Hal's important. Look, I am a kick butt engineer. I am a really good coder, but there's no way I can possibly keep track of 239 engineers and watch their code. I have to empower you and you and you to go and do what I think is right and what you think is right. And if I can't trust you, I need to go find other engineers. I believe firmly in software engineering. I want the 23-year-old art history major who minored in computer science and is an amazingly talented individual. I want her making the decision on what the Lint file looks like. Not me, not my senior technical leaders, the person who's doing the coding. And so that's what we're doing. The how is very, very important. And you think about the things I just talked about. These are all things that have changed in like the last 18 to 24 months in software engineering development, specifically for the enterprise. So I've ranted about how, but I'm, I'm going to go on a further rant on, um, is it? on uh, the ivory tower. This is how software development has worked for the enterprise for the last 30 years. I get your requirements. I listen to you as a as a, you're my customer, that's great. Oh, you want this, you want this, you want this. And then silence. And I go up in my ivory tower with my magical coders and we build something that we sort of kind of think is actually what you want, but we're not really sure because we don't ask you. And we build our code and maybe, just maybe, we'll give you a beta to give us your feedback. And when you say, well, this doesn't work, or this stinks, or this isn't what I wanted, you say, well, it's too late. Sorry, we're at beta. Right? That doesn't work in today's pace of enterprises. Oh, you may say, wait, the cloud. The cloud solves all these problems. <laughs> that makes it worse. So not only are they screwing up for every on-premises release, now they're screwing up every week. Awesome. I don't believe in the ivory tower. 
here's what I believe in and what I'm doing and changing. And what I advise, if any of you are working in software engineering and you have customers, bring them in to your scrum teams. You may think I'm out of my mind, I'm not. So today, for the first time, at least in IBM history, not sure about the rest of my competitors, whether it's Microsoft or Google or Oracle, whomever, if you come to my stand-ups, and you gotta remember, I have 239 engineers, I've got something like 50 scrum teams, okay? You come to my stand-ups, there are customers on those calls, right? And oh, by the way, those customers are the pigs, for those of you who know agile terminology, right? No, see it? So you guys know the story of the pig and the chicken? Okay, so for those of you who don't know the story of the pig and the chicken, pig and the chicken get together to make breakfast, okay? Chicken says, great, I'll make the eggs. Chicken makes the eggs, the pig says, I'm gonna make the bacon. Now who's committed? Not the chicken. So in Agile, we use the definition of pig and chicken to decide who, hate to say it this way, has to shut up. Those are the chickens. And who gets to talk? The pigs. So on my stand-ups, it's the pigs that are talking. Oh, by the way, the pigs are the people who coded it and the people who are gonna buy it and pay for it. So, but I also have my customers and my business partners on our playbacks. Do you guys know what an Agile playback is? So, Agile playback is after our two week iteration as a squad, as a scrum team, we do a show. But the show's for the team. The show's not like some you know, fancy PowerPoints with animations of pufferfish, which by the way is so much fun to do. I highly encourage it. But a playback is, here's the user story that I was trying to accomplish what the customer wanted, what my marketing team wanted, what my product team wanted. Here's the story, here's the code, here's it running. Ding, ding, ding. And then the last thing of those four steps are, here's my definition of done, D-O-D. -D. Doesn't span for Department of Defense, by the way. And in the D-O-D -D it says, thou shalt have the following things. Thou shalt have 90% automation of test. I have no testers in my organization, by the way. I have 239 engineers, there are no testers. Thou shalt not have anything that does not have an API. And oh, by the way, that includes markup. Everything has to have an API in my product. So you have those four things you go through. But I have customers on the call, and I have a fifth thing that I've added. I actually added it in January. I terrified my engineers by doing this. I told them, okay, we've gone two months now with customers joining our stand-ups and business partners and customers joining our, our, our playbacks. Here's a new part of the definition of done. If the customer looks at the user story and the code you wrote and it running, and they don't say the following, looks good, did exactly what you said you were gonna do, and I would pay money for it. If they don't say those three things, it's not done. It's not done. Go do an iter another iteration on it, sorry. So, no more ivory towers. No more going up and coding for six months, nine months, 12 months, God help me, 18 months. And then coming down and go, look, it's beautiful. And the customer goes, what the hell is that? It's not what I asked for. We're not doing that anymore. I have no betas. Don't need them. If you're my customer, you can see the code being written day by day if you want to. We talked a lot about open and, and the, the previous presenter had a lot of conversations and comments about open. I, I wanna sort of go a little further in, in my concept of open. Um, I believe, as I said before, everything has to be an API. Anything can be extended. Anything that can be changed. Anything should be modifiable. I don't care where it's deployed, by the way. I also believe that anyone should be able to see my source. Now, I'm, in, I'm using Battles right now to try to open up even more of what IBM Connections is, which is the product that my team makes. Um, but I will tell you this, for the first time in IBM history, there is no closed source repository for IBM Connections. There are 483,000 IBMers, every single one of them can do a pull request. I now have tech sailors. Uh, these are technical folks who have helped the salespeople. I have them issuing patches. They even work for me. I've had people that work in other divisions that I didn't even know we made this product, because in IBM it's hard to keep track, right? Um, that are sending me new code. And some of it's really good. And they follow the same DOD steps because they're all public. 
So just look at what I've done. I've now taken a 230 plus sized organization and I've effectively doubled or tripled or quadrupled what it can do. The fact that you work in a particular team and you work for a particular product is frankly irrelevant. If you're an engineer in an organization, you should be able to do anything that you want to do. You should be able to work off a common backlog. That to me is what open really means. And by the way, my next step on this is I'm opening it up to my customers and partners and I'm going to let them submit pull requests. Why not? So uh, a couple other things on openness that I really believe in is sort of two phrases around integration. Um, one is integrate in. So any product you make for the enterprise, you should be able to integrate inside of it other stuff. So if you think about companies, they have HR systems, they got payroll systems, they've got inventory systems, they've just got so much stuff. If you can't allow that stuff to go into the product that you're writing, your product's useless, frankly. Right? Your product actually can't solve their business problems. There is a phrase um, in computer science called sovereign pivots. You guys ever heard of sovereign pivots? Sovereign pivots are the most annoying thing for end users on the face of the earth. That is where they have to change their screen to some other screen to do their job. They hate it. I've, I've actually seen this, this is probably the funniest thing I've ever seen in computer science. I'll, I'll share this story with you. I, I'm not going to tell you which bank it was, but everyone knows there are five big banks in China, right? So I was in Shanghai a couple of years ago, and we made you know, another product that we make in, in my division in IBM. And, uh, and this product helps people build inside companies, build like really cool integration websites. Um, and uh, you know what product it is. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm, I'm sitting there and I wanted to know, what's your user story like? How do, you, how do you do your job during the day? And I wanted to sit down with a customer service representative, a CSR, sort of understand how they did their job. And they said, oh yeah, that's great, sure. We can sit down here, you can see how we do our job. And I watched them and they received a phone call and they had a little cheat seat over to their left and they hit Alt-Tab four times. Do, 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 do. There was that screen. They entered in the information. Oh, you need that? Alt-Tab three times. Do, do, do. Those are sovereign pivots. And you laugh, but believe it or not, that is what we do to our end users when we don't integrate in. The other part of integration is integrate out. So I highly encourage you as you build software that you allow the software you create to not have to be sovereign itself. In other words, the software that you build Yes, may have a user experience. Yes, may have a mobile app. And that's all great and wonderful and all. But other people should be able to build stuff with your stuff. And if they can't, again, what's the point? What are you really trying to do? You're building a point solution. You're not building a platform that other people can extend and work on. So openness means an awful lot to me. Yes, 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 it means open source too. Um, we have a process in IBM to handle open source. Almost all of my, what I'm building right now, and if you ever get bored, you can look up IBM in pink, um, which is the code name for the next version of connections I'm building. There is no proprietary software in pink at all. Not a line. There is no, if you know IBM products, there's no WebSphere, there's no Tivoli, there's no DB2, nothing. Um, so I do believe quite a bit in openness. The other thing that's changed, by the way, that's really fundamentally changing everything that's going on are deployment models. So everybody thought, all right, everyone in the world is going to go to the public cloud and no one's ever going to have software on premises again. How has that worked out? Not at all. It's been a colossal disaster. Yeah. So now what you've got is you've got a bunch of vendors who are trying to do a little bit of both. Um, and I'm not really sure what to call it because hybrid just seems a bit overblown of a term. Don't believe me? Uh, was two years ago, Microsoft announced they were not going to do another on-premises release of SharePoint, and they literally had a revolt of their users. What's causing this deployment model change? Well, German data privacy laws. For those of you who are aware, inside Germany, certain kinds of data have to stay in country, can't leave. In some cases, they can't leave the premises. And oh, by the way, these laws are echoing around the world. Um, I have a, a very large customer in Kuala Lumpur who uses my product, right? And they have to keep their Malaysian data in Malaysia, their Indonesian data in Indonesia, and their Thai data in Thailand. So it's not just isolated to, to Germany. And these things are actually growing. 
not decreasing. And yet I look at this, unlike everybody else, as an opportunity. Deployment models as they change will allow you to do some interesting things in technology if you're smart enough to do it. The first thing is, your workloads should never be tied to a deployment model. Your microservices that you build, they should be able to run in my cloud, your cloud, your brother's cloud, your sister's cloud, your former roommate's cloud, or some private cloud that your customer might want to stand up. And it should be easy and drop right in. You should be able to take your container, Kubernetes runs, everybody's happy. But you should also be able to do that with your data. That to me is real hybrid. What if the profile data of a particular user that's required in German, German data privacy laws has to stay on premises? What if it can sit there, but the workload that runs it is running in Amsterdam or London or the US? There's nothing technically stopping us from doing these kinds of things. Yeah, it's hard, but it can be done. Yeah, it's hard to make it perform it, but it can be done. You know, anything can be done in IT. It takes two things, time and money. I can make a shoe come out of this monitor if you give me enough time and money. So I want you to think about those two things are really causing companies um, to really change the way they're building software. Uh, the deployment models around where are the workloads and where are the data. So you think, this is great, Jason. I'm so excited. Look at all these things that are happening. What the heck does this mean for me, and why do I care? Well. Everything that I've just talked about kind of leads us into eating the puffer fish. To be able to, frankly, survive in this new world and build really compelling software for businesses, and in some cases for consumers, and keep up, you've got to be bold. You've got to be willing to change things. You've got to be anti-religious. And I don't mean, you know, you know, Christian or Muslim or Buddhist. I mean, stop having these lovely little things. I love React, I love Angular, I love React, I love Angular. I could care less. It's the time to go and relook at everything that you do, and if it doesn't make any sense anymore, blow it up. Blow it up. Break it. Try something else. I told my team they were very, very, very insistent. We want to do a bake-off between Angular and React JS. Again, I could care less. They did their little bake-off, they made their recommendation, they went with React, I said, that's great, but a year from now, I'm gonna make you do this again. What do you mean? Well, in a year from now, I'm sure there'll be something else and it might be better. And if it is, you know what? We're gonna go do that. Don't get wedded to the old way of doing things. That actually leads to poor quality, defects. The product that I inherited, it's embarrassing for me to say this, the product I inherited in, on August 1st, 2016, its primary UI framework used Dojo. I kid you not. And instead of changing, they kept finding ways around the limitations of Dojo because they were so wedded to the fact that it had to be Dojo. For you younger people here who don't know what Dojo is, it sucks. It's really bad jQuery that someone decided it'd be really neat to make JavaScript object-oriented. Anyway, now's the time to be disruptive. Now's the time to be bold. Now's the time to change. All of those things I just talked about are gonna force you as software engineering teams to change what you do continuously and constantly. And it's okay. Get comfortable with it. It'll be all right. Uh, my, my third week on the job, I went uh, to Dublin. I have about 90 engineers. And I spent like 45 minutes on stage talking platitudes and you know, here's what we do and whatever else and here's who I am and telling them stories about myself. Um, and then I told them, um, I hate to tell all of you this, but going forward I am banning Java. You could have heard a pen drop in the room. And these are all IBM engineers used to J2EE, which was actually invented in IBM, uh, used to WebSphere and all this technology. And I said, and I had to repeat it, I am banning Java. We will not write a line of Java going forward. You thought I would have killed someone in front of them. Uh, and my point, by the way, I'm a great Java developer, right? I love Java. I've met James Gosling. He's a nice guy. But Java's slow. It's expensive. You know, I can go and hire like 30 Node.js developers in Belarus and Minsk for like $28 an hour. Do you know how much it costs to get a really good Java developer? Like $150. They're expensive. You know why? Java's hard. So 
Be willing to question the things that you're doing. Be willing to ban stuff. Be willing to just be, you know, look, sorry, I know this is great and cool and all, but we're going to go do something else. Second thing is communities. Um, I went back to my line of talking about that we're going to build software with people. Start building communities inside and outside of your organizations. I'm doing this now. Uh, I have a, an interesting legacy of communities. Any of you ever heard of Open Social before, the foundation? Yeah. So I was, actually, I was the senior board member on the Open Social Foundation. Um, so we did some very cool things like activity streams, I'm sure all of you have heard of. Um, but one of the interesting things I learned about working with Google and Open Social and LinkedIn and Yahoo, whoever they own, his own, owns like Yahoo now, I, I can't keep track, um, and even MySpace. <laughs> Seriously, they were there. Um, but one of the things I, interesting that I learned about it is if you bring people together, whether they're from different vendors or you bring people together from you know, different vocations or different industries, you can do some pretty amazing things if you all have a common goal in mind. Um, and that's what Open Social actually did. Um, just did an amazing set of accomplishments. A lot of that stuff is now transitioned to the W3C, and we're off on a whole new mission. But build communities. Um, build different groups inside your organization and outside your organization that will allow you to accomplish more than you can today. Again, going back to what I was talking about before, that the how really, really, really matters, and the code doesn't matter quite as much as the how, communities allow you to really kind of force function the how. You can build whole cultures in these communities to drive the outcomes that you're looking to drive. Omnipresent. Again, going back to your software, your software needs to be able to run anywhere and everywhere. Um, one of the definitions of done for IBM Connections Pink is that every microservice has to be able to run on a Raspberry Pi. And if it doesn't, it's not done. Sorry. And you may think that's a stupid idea. Why would you do that, Jason? It's just dumb. Or you may think, oh, you're just being clever and cool. Well, I'm being clever and cool. But ignoring that for the moment, I'm doing it for a reason. And I'll, I'll give you an example. One of my favorite customers that's a very large airline based in Changi. I can't tell you who they are. They're a very large airline based in Changi. Um, but they have a challenge is that most of their aircraft maintenance is in Davao in the Philippines. Not a lot of bandwidth in Davao. Really bad latency in Davao. What happens when you have very little bandwidth and really high latency? You have extremely poor performance. My product that I sell to that airline I can't talk about takes almost 40 seconds for the home page to load in Davao. Would you use a system that takes 40 seconds for a home page to load? I can start counting. One, two. I can promise you you wouldn't want to do it. Why? Well, it was developed for a wonderful Web 2.0 world and has 158 XHR calls in it. And for engineers in North America, oh, this is no big deal. Right? But imagine this. Imagine that little Raspberry Pi and we park it in Davao. And imagine the microservices that it provides are that user experience. And imagine that came bundled with, let's say, you know, Redis that was doing caching. Well, now the performance in Davo, whoa, it's an awful lot faster. This is why I say your software needs to be run, able to run anywhere, and the data needs to be anywhere. Omnipresence, huge change. I don't believe in versions of software. Um, I don't believe in versions in general, but I don't believe in versions in software. Um, they were great when we needed to delineate things back in the late 80s and early 90s to understand the next capability of uh, a particular system. But I actually believe software today needs to be more of a journey, not a destination. Uh, so the product that I'm building right now will never be done. Ever. And I think that's great. I am willing to disrupt, add new features, add new capabilities, bring new pieces to bear. And I'm not going to have to worry the customer about things like upgrades. There is no upgrade. I have a bunch of Docker containers. I'm going to push down, push down to somebody's environment, wherever you're using your software, and it's just going to work. Right? If you make things a journey for your engineers, and they don't have to worry about, I've got to hit this arbitrary date for some arbitrary version that we have to fix, have to ship because marketing and legal said we have to ship it on this date for a particular reason, 
you free them. Now they can start thinking about truly innovating. They can really plan out their agile sprints. They can do some amazing things and they'll be willing to try stuff. So one of the things that's come out of my sort of taking the shackles off of these, you know, sort of the, the tyranny of software versions um, for my engineers is they've managed to come up with a piece of very clever technology. Um, and actually, actually it'll get in production in mid-April. But I'll, I'll tell you what it does and it's really cool. Uh, Stefan knows what it is. Um, we call it inside IBM Muse, M-U-S-E. And uh, we noticed there's a real problem with clouds um, that provide things like email and collaboration and stuff like that, right? So, you know, Google has one, Microsoft has one, we have one. There's all sorts of them, right? Biggest problem is, but what if I wanted my company colors? And what if I want to do, I was talking about integrating in, what if I need a button to look up the, the number in SAP that I have on-prem to kind of give me some more information on this little EIN number? You can't do that, right? The cloud is sort of fixed. Uh, if you look at my competitors in the market space, and they're fantastic people, uh, you can't take Gmail and completely change it so it looks like Outlook. Right? And, and, and I understand why they don't want to do that. I, I, I totally get it. But what we've done is we've realized that people want the cloud their way. And so we created a technology called Muse that I kid you not is server-side Grease Monkey. So you guys know what Grease Monkey is? I'm assuming everybody knows what Grease Monkey is, right? Um, so we are now allowing our customers to literally hack our software deliberately. And we are opening up the, the pathways so they can go in and change things and do whatever they want with it. And then it will run through a series of CI, CD, Selenium tests to make sure they don't break anything. They can drop their changes into Git. And then 10 minutes later, their change drops in. And for that particular organization, you know, it's pink and orange. And it's got these buttons over here and it's got pretty little pictures. And instead of having square pictures of their employees, they're round. So little things like that become possible when you stop looking at software as a version and you start looking at it as a journey that we are all going on together. So, eat the puffer fish. Be willing to disrupt things. Remember that your software has to be anywhere and everywhere. Break the rules. Take some risks. Try different things. Be incremental. Don't tie, there's a great phrase uh, in IBM. There's a lot of bad phrases in IBM, but I've always loved this one. Boil the ocean. It's a phrase in IBM that means sort of do anything and everything at all costs to solve this problem. I don't believe in boiling the ocean. Let's boil a teaspoon. See if that works. Maybe we'll try it again. Maybe even we'll boil a cup. But be incremental. Be willing to accept and embrace change inside your organizations. Remember that the how is far more important than the code that you're delivering to your customers. Passion is really important. Uh, I had a customer tell me, based in Stuttgart in Germany, uh, he said to me, uh, he, he listened to this exact same talk and he said, uh, so Jason, what you're really saying is if I have two vendors and they're building the exact same piece of software for me and they tick off all the same functionality, what you're saying to me is I should buy the one that the team went out and had beer together, had a good time together, were passionate about what they're doing and cared about each other and not the team that just kicked the box. I said, absolutely you should. Because at the end of the day, that's gonna be a much better product than this one. Even if they're functionally the same, they're gonna have more of a feel to them, almost a, a tactile experience. Uh, I brought up Andy Hertzfeld in the very first Macintosh before. It was not a good machine. At 128K, it could barely start, frankly. Finder 1.0 had a defect in it that you went into Finder, and if you had too many files, it would literally just go into an endless cycle or endless loop. Okay? It had problems, but wow, you could feel it. It almost buzzed with excitement. It had energy, it had passion behind it. That's when I talk about the how, it's really important. You can do that to your own software. And what, even though they're functionally equivalent, the guys that had a good time and really cared about what they're doing, the products can be infinitely better. And the last thing on here, disruption. Go and break stuff. I have the number one collaboration product in the world that I own. We are the market leader. If you look at Gardner, you look at Forrester, we're number one in the quadrants. 
and I'm literally rewriting it from the ground up, even though we're number one. And I am willing to do that because I want to not just be number one now, I want to be number one 10 years from now. And so should you. So I've thrown a lot at you, but to sum it up, eat the puffer fish. I heard it tastes really good. So thank you guys very much. Yes, sir. You said like you have your client in your agile process. What, what role, what people in the client? Who's, who's the client? That's a great question. Thank you. No, it's a really good question. So, of course, when I made this offer, I made it to my customers, my clients, IT organizations, their CIO's office, right? And so the first couple of these meetings, they brought their engineers. And that was okay. But then one of my customers did something really interesting. They brought a guy from HR to these stand-ups, and specifically to the playbacks. Uh, and I'll never forget this. Um, I got a phone call from the CIO of this company, and he said to me, you've done something for me by having me in this agile process that I haven't been able to do in five years with his own internal customers, you know, HR and sales and such. The HR person had told him, wow, I had no idea it was so hard to build software. <laughs> I always thought this was really easy. When I asked for your button, I didn't understand why it was, took so long. But what's interesting is, since he had the courage to bring the guy from HR, now a lot of my other customers are bringing salespeople in. They're bringing in people from you know, finance and what have you. So it sort of started off mostly just IT, but now it's like a nice mix of everybody who uses my product at the company. So I had no idea how software was so hard to build. <laughs> yes, sir. How deep the, the thinking goes on limiting conversions, or what how you sort of then change dealing with compatibility with embedded systems, uh, support arrangements, that, all that sort of stuff that, that we need to with on premises software, we having customer pressure to keep supporting all versions, all versions of the system, right? Mm -hmm. Which is Ubuntu, that's become an issue. Sure. How do you see that being addressed in the version of the industry right? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> The first thing is we have adopted uh, purely Docker containers for our, our future, right? So Docker Enterprise has very clear requirements. In fact, they just forked like Thursday of last week, if I recall correctly, into you know, sort of the community edition and their enterprise edition. So they have very clearly set requirements from a server side perspective. And we simply say we support those and nothing else. And if you want something else, well, I'm sorry, it doesn't work. Um, the same thing we're doing with database. Today, my product, God help me, we support three versions of Oracle, two versions of Microsoft SQL Server, and DB2. That's unsustainable, right? My, my competitors don't support 12 different databases or what have you, right? So now we have a really new choice for our customers. It's Mongo or uh, Mongo, right? And, and we make very clear you know, this is the Mongo version that we support and test on, and if you don't have those, sorry. The third thing I'm doing, you brought up clients, and this is an interesting conversation. I am abandoning the browser. I think the browser is the crappiest app platform I have ever seen. In fact, it's this bad, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the last release of my product that had a version, which actually comes out in a week, um, then we're ha not having any more versions, we're going into the pink world. I have to support five different browsers from four different vendors. Microsoft has two, as you know, right? right? I have to deal with the fact that two of those vendors hate each other so much they fork the same open source project, WebKit. That's Google and, and, and Apple, by the way. Right? Do you imagine doing accessibility on five different browsers and how much that costs me? It's insane. So we are going to Electron. You guys know what Electron is? Electron allows you to continue using web technologies, but wrappers it and allows you to access native features on the desktop operating system. So Electron's an open source project, IBM is a sponsor of it, it's a great community, but I'm gonna have a Windows app and I'm gonna have a Mac app. And I'm gonna only support browser for read only. That's it. Uh, it it's unsustainable. I can't add new features or functions. I'm spending 60% of my time on making things accessible. And by the way, I believe in accessibility, I just only wanna do it once. I don't wanna do it five times. So, Long-winded answer, but um, that's what we're doing. Yes, ma'am. Can I just um, ask you know, in your experience and in your interaction with the client? First of all, 
what I see and my view, it's not it's not that I I can't produce a good song. It's not my method being wrong and my how being wrong. I do want an all inclusive uh, developer and client kind of relationship. However, uh, often one of the questions that come up is, I can't sign an open-ended contract with you because it is a journey and it's no end point. <laughs> I must tell my boss or boss that there is some kind of ending to this thing. And, and that's one very common question that I get. So, would you, would you also land in this kind of situation? Someone? Absolutely. It's actually even if we counter propose a, a time and material kind of contract basis, right? They're still not happy with it because on top of that, when they say, yeah, but everything that you do and I do, everyone will know. So. Yeah. Customers hate T and M. They hate time and material contracts. They they just they hate them. So I'll tell you what I'm doing. Doesn't mean it will help you, but but this is what I'm doing. So today in IBM. Uh, our traditional licensing, licensing model is you have a license in perpetuity for the version that you purchase from IBM. And we are obligated by IBM law, whatever that is, that we have to support that particular version for eight years. And you wonder why I'm tired. Um, <laughs> so that's current steady state. And what happens is after the first year of purchase, the customer is required to buy something called SNS and IBM. Subscription license effectively, effectively, right? And if they keep buying this, then when the next version comes out, they're entitled to it. And then that eight year clock starts ticking again. Yay! Um, with Pink, we're not doing that. So that's the sort of the current world that we're in. With Pink, we're treating every deployment as if it's a cloud deployment. Whether it's on-premises in a customer's private cloud running Docker and Kubernetes, or it's in my public cloud. You pay a fee per user per month. You can either sign a two-year contract, three-year content, and get better terms, or you can pay month to month. But when that subscription ends, you have no longer have access to the software, you can no longer use it, you are no, no longer licensed for it, and there's no eight year support agreement because there's no version. You just bought pink. I'm not sure that solves your particular problem, but that's what I'm doing. And it, I, I can promise you my customers, when they first hear this, ah, ah. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the second thing we're doing because the add on to what you asked me is, okay, how do you deal with upgrades and maintenance in that model? So. Uh, if my customer has a private cloud or my business partner has a private cloud and they're reselling Pink as a solution, again, Pink has you know, all these collaboration things in it, uh, they have two choices. You can either be live, literally, in my CI CD stream, meaning that if I fix a security patch right now in 10 minutes, you have it. Or you stay one quarter behind. Those are your two choices. No in between, no, oh, I don't want that patch. You either get it live when I'm patching my own own cloud, or you can wait a quarter. That's it. Yes, sir. A quarter or up to a quarter? No, a quarter. No, 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 because otherwise I'm supporting one to n number of microservices, right? So when the quarter comes, there's a release. If you want to stay on that, awesome. Now, some of my customers, like I have a lot of banks. As you can imagine, IBM has a lot of banks as customers. I know that's crazy. But they want to do security stands, bring in Deloitte and Touche to, to do their, you know, whatever it is that they do with going to analysis. And, stuff. and that's awesome. But they can do that in three months. And so that's why we give them that one quarter behind option in the pipeline. Long-winded answer. There's not a, so I'll be honest with you. Um, there's a great phrase um, by one of the founders in my country. I, I, I grew up in Miami um, in the United States. And, uh, one of the founders in my country was a gentleman named John Adams. Um, and on the 2nd of July, 1776, when there was a boat and we finally decided to say bye-bye to Britain, we probably used the middle finger too, but I'm not gonna do that right now. Um, he said something that was very poignant. He said, we are about to take a leap into the dark. And, and I will tell you with Pink, and I'm gonna be very honest with you, I'm about to take a leap into the dark. 
and I may be wrong in what I'm trying to do, but I firmly believe that this is the right path forward. Um, and it's gonna be a little scary, and we may fall. But um, invite me back next year, and I'll tell you what I learned. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Everyone wanna say, who's that guy in the wheelchair? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's the guy in the wheelchair? It looks like somebody's been hitting him. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you said you give everything an API. Now the question is, is it null or empty? Because you never know. Oh, I'm missing with your shirt. <laughs> um, and I'm just um, wondering what that, what that means. What's the alternative to not giving everything an API? Well, uh, bad coding. Um, so uh, I'll give you a, an example. In my product today, there are a number of functions that are accomplished by a user that the actual end function back to the back end is a form post. Kind of hard to automate a form post. Um, so when I go to say that everything is an API, I mean literally every, every particular action that has to be performed is an API. We're also adding a scripting language to make it easy for people to kind of change things or build things. Um, funny enough, based on Lotus Notes at formula language, but we'll leave that away. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, what's old is new again. But even those particular functions like at now in uh, formula language gives you the current date time, right? That's actually an endpoint. It's actually a rest endpoint. So literally everything is going to be an API, um, including, and you know, Amazon is very famous for this. In Amazon, everything's an API too, including their markup. So when you start getting the markup that's pulled down in Amazon, all of that is an API endpoint, even broken down into pieces. So um, that's going to be true of Pink. And I can steal stuff from Jeff. Why not? He doesn't mind. Maybe you'll send me an Alexa, I don't know. <laughs> That'd be cool. Anything else? I mean, I, I have something I'm curious about, but I don't know if it's a good thing to ask. I, oh, now I really <laughs> want to know. Come on, let's hear that one. <laughs> you know, you, you have She's going to say, are you crazy? <laughs> you have a team of 200 and things. I do. The data, from the data, you say, there's no more job. How many of them actually go to work? Nine quit. Huh? Nine. Nine left. Yep. Only? Oh, yep. Out of the 239? Yep. And nine that left. And the rest picked up new skills. The less, rest of them went off and learned Loopback, which you guys, like the world's most awesome framework around um, Express and Node. Loopback's awesome. Open source project is fantastic. Um, yeah, but. So they, they, they started at the beginning of the journey and they just decided to uh, Yeah, so I, I did something crazy, certainly in IBM. Uh, I know you're not surprised now. Um, I gave them four weeks off, my entire team. And I said, go learn loopback, go learn document databases, go learn all these things, and build me some experiments. I didn't even tell them why. Now you can imagine my boss was not very happy with me doing this, but whatever, right? The, the idiot hired me, I mean, he's gonna have to deal with it. Um, well, we I did. I, I haven't been fired yet. I'm shocked. Um, <laughs> Actually, Jason, to be honest, the main reason why your engineers stayed that they were so happy to get rid of your predecessor. Yeah, I'm not touching that. <laughs> <laughs> not touching that one. But here was the cool thing that came out of that. One, they realized, wow, Jason's right. If we adopt these other technologies, we can go faster. Right. It's not that easy to build a really solid API in Java. It takes some work. I mean, once you build them, they're fantastic, right? But it's not that easy to do and get it right. It is dumb, stupid, simple to do it in loopback. I mean, I can do it in three or four lines of code and you're done. So they learned that, but here's the coolest thing that came out of it. One of the experiments they built is something called Live Grid. Um, and it's basically this really cool little environment where it allows in users to build apps using those little app formula languages. But the really cool thing about it that they did was it not only builds a little app, like I can keep track of my sales opportunities or whatever else as a, as a sales guy or whatever, but it dynamically provisions and builds APIs for you. So it figures out what you're trying to build and it goes and constructs API endpoints for you so that other apps can consume the capabilities of that app and they can chain themselves together. That all came out of that four weeks and we're shipping in September. So, you know, nine people quitting? Oh, well, bye-bye. <laughs> yes, sir? 
I know I'm running out of time. I'll, I'll try to hurry. Uh, if I get it right, uh, you're quite a fan of Node, right? I am, are you, yes. Are you using it in that product? Oh, yeah. And um, well, for me, I'm sorry to say that, but Node is one of the, it's the mother of dependency nightmares. Mm -hmm. It is. Are you doing anything about it? Because I see there's a, there's a nice talk <coughs> of a guy who said, if you are hungry and you walk down the street and you find, you stumble over a hamburger, would you just pick up and eat it? No, you wouldn't. You'd be but surprised. But in, <laughs> I'd eat it. In, in code, right, we find a lot of people importing all the libraries that have anything that they might want to use and don't care about it. I see projects actually getting aware of it and then saying, okay, before we import anything, let's look at what they have done, what, what we like, and how do we implement it for us so that we don't get in another dependency. But it's quite some work. Right? It is. So one of the things we've done, not saying I've solved this problem, right? is we have our own internal NPM. And all of the libraries in those NPMs, I have code scanned, I have licensed and gone through legal approval on. Uh, and those are the libraries we can use. When you start to need another library, it actually kicks off a workflow that goes, okay, here's the new dependency, here's the things we need to do, and it's gotta go through all that process. And you know, IBM has more lawyers than engineers, so it takes a little while for us to make these decisions um, before that library can actually be used. Um, not saying it solves the problem, but it certainly mitigates it so my engineer knows when they bring in a particular dependency that that dependency is okay, right, from the get-go. I always see that if you have this in multi levels because the people who write a library, they use other libraries, they use other libraries, mm -hmm. they use other, and then somewhere down there, there's an import of a library that have, has five lines, and this is why the whole stack fails because that has some version that doesn't work. Or that has GPL v3 on it, and I can't touch it, you know, right? I mean, I can't. I, I literally can't. Um, but that's how we're mitigating it for now. Um, uh, the other language you're using is, I don't know if people are aware of this, but Microsoft, excuse me, IBM and um, Apple are very close. I don't think you guys probably know this, right? Um, and we actually partnered on open sourcing Swift. Uh, and so a lot of my business logic is actually written in Swift, because Node is great for endpoints. It's lousy for business logic. Uh, but Swift is fantastic for business logic, so. Um, a lot of the business logic we're doing in Swift, which is the opposite of Node. It really doesn't have a dependency problem, right? You know, it's, it's sort of the, the anti-Node pattern, but um, a very cool language. And uh, I'll, I'll finish with this. I know we're, we're out of time, but again, economies of scale. If I can have my business logic written in Swift, going back to my T-shaped engineers, that means all my iOS developers who work on my mobile app, guess what? They can now write business logic. Kind of hard to do that with Java. And anyone who tells me here that Android uses Java, you are so wrong. That is not Java. I have no idea what the hell that is, but it's not Java. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys very much for your time. Really appreciate it.